pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you and welcome once again. We have interpretation uh, services available in Spanish. Will the Spanish interpreter please raise your hand and introduce yourself in Espanol? Gracias. Uh, today's proceedings are being broadcast live by Boston City TV on YouTube as well as Comcast Channel 24, RCN Channel 13, and Fios Channel 1962. It will be rebroadcast at a later date. Before we get started with today's interview, and welcome Dr. Caselius, we'll be getting uh, to you in just a moment. Um, I want to uh, once again, um, for the benefit of those that didn't have a chance to tune in yesterday, extend a thanks, a heartfelt uh, and warm thanks to the search committee that's been carrying the load here for us over the last eight months. Uh, we've got two members from the search committee as part of our committee, uh, our vice chair and co-chair of the search, uh, Alex Oliver Davila, as well as Mr. O'Neill, and uh, our um, other co-chair, uh, Dr. J. Keith Motley, will be joining us uh, a little bit later this afternoon as well. Um, I want to thank these folks for uh, their volunteering, uh, first of all, and spending uh, nearly 70 hours in meetings over the last eight months, including 40 in confidential candidate interviews. Uh, they interviewed 12 candidates. Uh, they uh, brought back seven for a second round, and we have three finalists before us as the fruits of that hard work. And so I want to thank that group once again. And as I mentioned earlier, today the school committee is interviewing the second of three finalists uh, for superintendent of the Boston uh, public schools, and as I just noted, that's Dr. Brenda Casilius. Welcome, uh, Doctor. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here to meet all of you finally in person. So thank you very much for having me. So Dr. Casilius has spent three decades as an educator, uh, most recently as the commissioner of uh, education in uh, the great state of Minnesota, and um, we welcome her today. And we'll get back to um, provide you with an opportunity to provide an opening statement just before we get into questions in, in just a moment. Um, but I want to uh, remind folks that are watching uh, in the crowd as well as online uh, that um, uh, Dr. Casilius, uh, a, a bit earlier today, um, engaged in a uh, panel discussion with community partners in the district. And uh, later this afternoon, she'll be heading out to the Mildred Avenue K-8 to in Mattapan to meet with students and teachers. Later this evening, she will return to these chambers, and that uh, panel will also be televised with uh, parents and school leaders from across the district. So, uh, you know, it's certainly a, a hectic schedule and a, <laughs> um, a packed day, uh, but it's uh, truly emblematic of uh, the work that is, uh, the Boston Public Schools Superintendent does on a daily basis, working with uh, folks all across our city. And uh, while we're on that point, I will also say thanks once again to the uh, 21 um, volunteers that we had for the search panels as well. Uh, these are folks that are uh, taking time away from their jobs this week and, and busy lives to uh, to help us supplement this process and, and provide the opportunity to have as many looks as possible at the finalists as, as well. And as I mentioned yesterday, again, for the benefit of folks just turning in, we've got nine parents, uh, three students, two school leaders, um, uh, two teachers, uh, the chair of the Boston uh, City Council's Education Subcommittee, and our uh, uh, assistant Superintendent for Opportunity Achievement Gaps, among many others, playing a vital role in uh, the community conversation that's happening with these candidates. So we thank them for that work as well. And finally, I do want to thank once again the Shaw Foundation for support supporting the robust community process that we do have uh, before us uh, with these finalists. So now to the business at hand. Uh, Dr. Casilius, before we move into questions, I'd certainly like to uh, open it up to you for an opening statement. Well, Thank you so much for having me, and thank you to the entire board for taking the time. You have three wonderful candidates uh, that the search team has put forward. I know that they spent a number of hours. It's been an incredibly rigorous process, um, and I've learned a lot about Boston. And so now is my opportunity to learn a little bit more about your priorities, uh, contextualize the, what I've read, and better understand um, where you're at as a district and where you're at as a community in full city about um, really making good outcomes and getting good outcomes for children and families and communities. And so I'm uh, honored to be here today, humbled to be among three wonderful candidates and uh, look forward to your questions to be able to dig a little bit more into my preparation, both professionally and personally, um, and my education and uh, that prepares me to uh, potentially be your next superintendent and to work alongside you um, 
again, to get great, great results for kids. So very excited to be here. Well, thank you so much, Doctor. And before we get into questions, um, I just want to uh, lay a couple uh, ground rules for expectations for the committee, uh, much as we did yesterday. I did also want to ask you a question. Did you have a chance to watch any of the uh, panels from yesterday? I did not. I wanted to just focus today on get my mind right for the full day, and so I did not watch those. Well, excellent. I know you've had a very busy schedule. You were interviewing <laughs> um, yourself yesterday with, uh, for another position in the state of Michigan, if I I'm was. not mistaken. Uh, well, that's great. Um, and for as far as um, the way that we'll process today's interview, um, we're going to start with questions first from uh, the members who haven't had the pl pleasure of meeting you, both um, myself as well as uh, Mr. O'Neill and uh, Ms. Oliver Davila have spent a number of hours with you uh, in private conversations or through the search committee interviews uh, to date, just as we have with the other finalists. And so we've got an, an accurate view, I think, of, of where you're at, but we want to give an opportunity to our student as well as our, our okay. fellow colleagues to uh, ask questions. And uh, I'm going to ask my colleagues to uh, limit those initial questions to two each uh, so that we have an opportunity to make our way all around, and then we'll have a, ch a second opportunity to make ourselves okay. um, uh, make our way around again with any further follow-up questions. Great. So today I'm going to ask uh, if Ms. Robinson might uh, help lead us off with her questions. Great. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, my first question is about our schools. Mm -hmm. So we have 125 schools, very diverse. We have traditional district exam, pilot, Horace Mann Charter, industry <laughs> charter, turnaround, innovation, alternatives. Um, the district is a lot of autonomy. The yeah. question for me is how do we bring all of this autonomy together for accountability? And if there were several key strategies across the district for the next year, what might they be? And how would you work to get all of our autonomous schools focusing on one set of goals, however they would go about doing that, so that we really can see some improvement around student um, achievement? Well, thank you for that question, and it's really nice to meet you. I think that autonomy is a really important part of um, creativity and innovation and feeling self-directed in your own work and owning your own work, so I, I have a strong value. I also believe that um, becoming a professional learning community and part of a team means that you have to have a really strong shared purpose and shared understanding of the work, and um, there's some core principles to that. So. I would uh, really work to define what are our core principles and core values and what are the behaviors underneath that, such as um, at the Minnesota Department of Education, those core principles and values that were defined by um, my staff was uh, leadership, uh, equity, and collaboration. And I believe that um, here, the similar values you have and, and is around equity and around collaboration and inclusion. Um, and I think once you have some core values that are agreed upon, then those kind of permeate how you create your professional learning community. So even within an autonomous structure, you can still have core principles and values that drive your decision making um, and to drive how you interact with one another. Um, and so that's one step I would take to bringing people together. I'd work on principal leadership so that the leadership principles that we all aspire to are ones that are shared and we support one another in that so that the individual success of one school is our shared success on all schools and collectively we work together so it's not just um, my own individual success, but it's, I feel really good when everyone else succeeds as well. Uh, it's not a competitive but a collaborative uh, community and so uh, with charters I, I want to see them be successful because they have children in them so as long as charters are serving public school children it's important that those public school children are uh, getting what they need to be successful as well as our traditional schools our pilot schools and whatever type of structure you have um, it's important that children underneath that and teachers feel supported and have the resources from their school leaders to to um, to move forward. I think a, a shared vision, um, shared core principles, and attention to uh, um, the similar measuring and similar accountability uh, is really important to creating kind of this underlying connectedness of, of all of the different types of schools. Thank you. My second question, um, I read with interest one of the interviews you had done when you were leaving your role as commissioner. 
and you had five lessons learned, yep. and one of them was around low test scores aren't necessarily an indication of student achievement or teacher effectiveness. So my question is, that's a wonderful statement to be able to make as a yeah. commissioner. How does that play out as a superintendent and we're getting back test scores in yeah. the flat? And how do we understand what our kids are learning or not learning or what kind of rigor exactly, what goes into this and how do we improve our district and our outcomes? Right, well thank you for that question. It's, um, you know, we have accountability systems, I said earlier in the community panel, that we base that a lot on standardized testing and how that measures our success when there's so many other factors to children's success and outcomes and family success and outcomes and community outcomes all together for how we set up conditions for children to succeed. And so when I was saying that, um, I believe strongly that there are great teachers who are um, teaching uh, good, good content but it's not necessarily the content that's on our state comprehensive exam. So children are learning things, but we're, they, don't, they haven't been um, given the test because they can't look at the test. So they, they don't know what's on the test. And so when we give children these comprehensive state tests, it's not that they're not learning what the teacher is teaching, it's that they're teaching, kids are learning, their do teachers are doing their local assessments and they're getting good results and then they end up taking the comprehensive state test and they're not. And mostly that's because we had so many years of budget cuts in Minnesota that we lost our curriculum coordinators, teachers were not given good professional development around the standards and of course our tests align to our standards. And so we had done a survey with Wilder Group and they did an evaluation and asked uh, teachers how, how familiar are you with the state standards? And we found that 17% of our teachers were actually, of our ELA teachers were actually fully implementing the ELA standards. So that told me that if, if they're not teaching the standards and we're testing the standards on a comprehensive assessment at the end of the year, then we can see why there's this mismatch. So um, I think there are many multiple measures in which we can use to address, and we tried to with our new SS, ESSA accountability system, um, but I still think there's, there's still work to do in these accountability systems because I think the real things that parents want us to be able to deliver is a high, and a high quality education is a well-rounded education. They want arts, they want music, they want um, science at elementary school. They want to see their children be connected and have debate programs and after school programs and a rich uh, community and PE every day. So I think that, you know, how do you measure the, those opportunities against the quality of, of opportunity for children in a school against how well they're doing in, in the actual test and outcome. Now certainly as commissioner, I had to create accountability systems that were standard, st based on standardized testing. And we got better at cutting up the data or measuring growth and that kind of thing, but uh, or looking at EL proficiencies, um, but that's still a test-based proficiency. Um, and there's still a lot more work to do in terms of gathering these data systems. And so we made some, some progress, but there's still a lot more progress to be made around how we assess student learning and outcomes. I'm not saying there's not, and I said this earlier today as well, there's not an important piece that, uh, that we get from standardized tests. I think that it can give us broader, larger uh, information around how we're aligning to our standards. I think it gives us good information about how uh, well our instruction is and how deeply embedded those standards are within the instruction and within the units and lessons that teachers prepare. But that's at a much higher level in terms of how we plan and what materials we use and that sort of thing. So um, so that that's what I meant with, with that comment. Um, I hope I answered your question. Yes, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. Dr. Coleman? Great, well, welcome. It's nice to have someone who's understand this is a beautiful spring day, not <laughs> <laughs> late and rainy. Um, and I, I'm excited to meet you and our co my colleagues in the committee have clearly found a wonderful deep pool as you suggested and That's your qualifications right. are outstanding. So I wanna ask questions about some of the issues I think we face here and also nationally. So my first question is, um, what do you think about comprehensive or neighborhood schools with rural wraparound services as a way of closing the opportunity gap? Or another way to ask that question is, you know, what are the public health strategies that a city needs to implement to support the district's efforts in closing the achievement gap? So, the, you know, how, how do we think about um, this comprehensive work around schools and the quality of kids' lives beyond the school building? And what, what's your thinking about that and how you implement that as a commissioner? 
Well, thank you, Dr. Coleman. I just think that um, all of the outside of school factors are very critical to closing achievement gaps. Um, we can take care of the academic side in, inside the school of creating alignment to standards and assessments and good instruction and pedagogy and all of that. But there's also the fact that there are outside factors that impact whether ch children are successful or not and whether the community has stepped up to provide uh, stop gaps so that children do succeed. So it's leveraging all of that. So as the commissioner, I've been able to work across agencies to double community health um, grants that go to out to our school districts um, and they work with community partners. So that was through the Department of Human Services. We've worked with um, uh, school safety with our uh, Department of Public Safety around evacuations and fire drills and all of that. Um, and we've worked with um, the Department of Health on home visiting for early childhood and um, health outcomes in terms of surveying all, all students with a, a school safety survey and how, how are they feeling welcome and within their schools. So I think that all of those different indicators and working cross is, is how you do it cross uh, sector. And then we also have passed uh, full service community schools model uh, and legislation so that we could provide grants. Our department's responsible um, for the delivery of that and the support of that and uh, going out and identifying where that is. We've also supported promised neighborhoods and uh, transformation zones around early childhood access and then aligning systems and supports for families with navigators that go to the home and work and advocates. Um, so those are partnerships. It's not something I've done directly. The community and the school, local school district is responsible for that. I have um, worked with, in Memphis, what we did was we had family liaisons in our schools that needed um, additional uh, support through, correct, through corrective action from the state. We put in family liaisons to work and coordinate services of families within the school in terms of working with social workers and um, outside partners to provide the crisis support or other supports for family around housing or health access. So it's really leveraging all of those pieces to create um, equity. Even within uh, high schools, when I was high school assistant principal at Washburn, there was a clinic uh, that we had clinics within our high schools, uh, at some of our high schools, uh, that the uh, hospital clinics and mental health services within the school so students didn't have to go outside of school to get the mental health services. So uh, trying to you know, coordinate those services in our high poverty schools would be really, I think, a critical um, lever in terms of impacting the out of school factors. And then working, like Dr. Robinson said, to align more of the vision and the practices with teachers and with school leaders around the other aspects of academics and rigor. So um, in five years, after you've been here for five years, what do you think you'd be known for? Well, I would hope to be known for um, being, having Boston Public Schools be the parents' first choice in the community. Um, I, that, that would be a goal. I also would like to see it be voted in as the top 10 places to work. So I would like, out of large organizations in Massachusetts, I would like to see that the employees who come here are happy and um, enjoy working because I think when you have happy employees and happy staff, you have happy children. Uh, and their mental health is good, and then children <laughs> have the kind of support systems that they do. And then I'd like to be known for someone who was a collaborator, who was able to come together, craft a vision with the community, and in collaboration with the community, so that um, it, it comes to be owned by everybody. That it's not just the vision of the superintendent or Boston Public Schools, it's actually the vision of the entire community. And that, um, they, they want to, and they, they, it's, so, it's so embedded within the community and so much a part of them that it wouldn't matter if I was leading it or if the mayor was leading it, the community would demand it of their leaders. And that's what I would like to be known for. Great, thanks. Yeah. Thank so if there's time, I'd love a last question. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Coleman. I'll try well, to be brief. If I, I mean, I want to make mm -hmm. sure I get to everybody's questions, so I'll try to be brief and concise. Certainly appreciated. Um, we'll move on now to our student representative, Ms. Uh, Evelyn Reyes. Hi, Evelyn. Hi. Um, all right, so students in Boston are known for their organizing and for being proactive and for being especially strong when it comes to showing out for their education, um, you know, in their own best interest and in the best interest of their peers. And so I'm curious to know how you would support the priorities <coughs> of student-led organizations and their actions um, if chosen as superintendent. Well, thank you, Evelyn, and thank you for your activism. I think this is the 
one of the best generations. I always say that the youth is gonna save us adults, you know, because we're getting in the way of ourselves. Um, so I'm very appreciative. I have a freshman in college right now and she's quite the little activist. She's gonna be an art teacher, so I just love her. Um, so I would just embrace it um, and try to help you understand your role in that and, and how to be heard and how to move policy um, because that's a skill. Uh, you can't just go out and shout you have to actually bring solutions and have an agenda and then know how to advocate and who to talk to to get your, your um, policy uh, suggestions or what you want to get accomplished, accomplished, and then help you connect you to other partners within the community can help be a voice um, and help you, help you advocate for yourselves. And so part of that, and then doing that in a safe environment, for instance, if students want to have a walkout, I want to make sure that students are escorted, that they have proper um, safety measures in place so that when they go out, it's a safe walkout. <coughs> and that they come back to their learning. You know, they've made their statement, but they come back and we get the learning done. Thank you. Um, and I think just as active as the students are, our communities are also very active, um, meaning parents and other education advocates. and. That being said, sometimes the community's visions for BPS don't align with the mayor's. And so I, I would like to hear how you would balance the mayor's priorities with those of the community. Oh, thank you for that. I, I would say that everybody has a right to their voice and to be heard in a respectful manner. Um, and we will have public dissension. I mean, there, it's a healthy democracy when you have a healthy conflict. It's how you give students the skills to work through that healthy conflict that really um, makes an agenda move forward. And so I would assume the mayor would wanna hear that. Um, you know, he may not agree. Sometimes you have to disagree. I said, I said this earlier as well. The governor, uh, that I learned so many great things from Governor Mark Dayton, I just very much admire him. He said, sometimes you agree two things that you don't agree with, but you listen and you value everybody's voice in that. And so, and then you try to find those places where you do agree and you make progress. And so that's the approach I would take. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Reyes. Dr. Rivera. Good afternoon. Hi. Um, so I'm a professor at UMass Boston and we have several programs in partnership with BPS for training uh, teachers of color, um, trying to recruit. Um, Teachers of Color um, is, is, is in a school district where this, you know, the majority of the teachers are, are, are white, um, in a school district where the majority of the students are students of color. Yeah. Um, and so I just wonder if you could say a little bit about um, your experience working with community partners, colleges and universities on trying to recruit and retain uh, teachers of color and also, why do you think that matters? Well, thank you very much, Dr. Rivera. One of the first bills that the governor signed, I think it was the first one, was alternative certification. And that was a way to look at um, out of field, um, mid-career folks who are interested in becoming um, uh, certified to become teachers, as well as teachers who were, you know, in Minnesota, you get, um, you're a science teacher in a rural area and you wanted, you could teach chemistry because you had a chemistry license, but they had a shortage area in biology, and so you'd wanted them to be able to get the credential in biology, so we worked uh, through that and worked through different licensing schemes to be able to help um, get folks in, and recently we just passed tiered licensure to allow for the um, uh, recruitment of teachers of color and to try to get more teachers of color into the field. We also have put money toward Grow Your Own programs, St. Paul, and Minneapolis Public Schools has done uh, Grow Your Own programs for quite a while. We have a paraprofessional step-up program. So many of our paraprofessionals are bilingual, uh, have special ed background and experience, but really, you know, they're underpaid. And so because they're underpaid, they can't afford to go to school. So you have to create these programs and tuition reimbursement schemes and, and, um, and uh, tuition grants so that you can get your paraprofessionals involved and get them the credentials because they love our kids and it's just getting them the proper training um, to be able to be certified to be able to go into uh, the field. And then once we do get teachers of color into the, into the um, community, I think it's important that we support them. And so there's not just the recruitment, there's also the retention and the building of a welcoming uh, com a community with affinity groups and other supportive structures so that um, they're welcome and included within the um, community. 
So I think it's important. I, I think it's essential that students have teachers and, and paraprofessionals and others who look like them. But I, I also think it's important that we have step up programs and grow your own programs to be able to increase the number of um, folks that we have uh, and different backgrounds and experiences working with our children so they can see reflected in those adults that work with them, um, look like them. Thank you. Um, so in 2002, Massachusetts, um, through a statewide referendum, um, outlawed, so we'll call it outlawed bilingual education um, into a, a particular model. Um, the Look Act that was passed last summer has um, now provided alternative uh, alternatives for bilingual education in our state. I wondered if you could say a little bit about um, what your experience has been working with English learners, what are some of the more effective models, and if you are familiar with the Look Act, how there might be opportunities um, for our school district. Thank you, Dr. Rivera, for that question. It's a really important one, and I was sad to see that um, they had outlawed bilingual education. I think it's important to see language as an asset, language and culture both as an asset. Um, and so we also passed what we called the LEAPS Act in Minnesota to be able to give uh, merging multilingual uh, learners uh, and build on their assets and to build bi bilingual immersion schools, um, dual, um, dual immersion schools, and work um, to embed inclusionary practices like push-in practices was our model. Um, of support to make sure general education teachers have the proper supports in both um, special education and also EL to make sure that we're not disproportionately assigning students who are EL to special education simply because of language barriers, so looking at that level as well. So I think it's, imp it's really critical um, uh, to look at your practices across, um, to embed language across the curriculum, to work on vocabulary strategies, to increase vocabulary knowledge within the content knowledge across all disciplines, um, to have uh, joint productive activity where teachers are, are uh, creating content and, and knowledge with the students and that it's contextualized and there's cultural competency as well as looking at um, opportunities for instructional conversations to happen regularly in the classroom so that students are talking with their teachers in bilingual way in their both home language and their um, in, in and in English both peer-to-peer -peer and also uh, peer to adult or student to adult thank you dr. Rivera mr. Tron uh, good afternoon welcome to Boston uh, thank dr. You Okay, my question is a little more on a global side okay. rather than the individual experience uh, in the position of a, uh, of a superintendent. Sometimes it does require you to think globally to resolve issues. So the first question is, uh, what is y your personal definition of equity? And given the uh, competing som and sometimes uh, differing um, interests of different communities uh, regarding education in Boston, how do you apply your own or best practices uh, guiding principle of equity in, in issues relating to uh, budget, in issues relating to programs, and, and things that are educationally related. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Equity is an incredibly important piece. Uh, sometimes people get e equality mixed up with equity, and I'm sure, and, and I said this again earlier, that um, when you, you've probably seen the, the picture depicting the kid with the little boxes um, and looking over a fence, um, and you give, a, give that child who's smaller a, a another box so that they can look over the fence and have the same view which people will say is equity and I, I'm more of the um, mindset and philosophy of just remove the fence and so but there's a little bit of you have to build the boxes and you have to remove the fence for some kids and so I think it's really important uh, when defining equity that you're defining it that you give kids what they need 
um, and you ensure that you're filling back the gaps where they are and you meet students where they are. And so that's my philosophy and you try to get every single dollar and, and get it to the most vulnerable kids. And that's about the budget. Um, so the equitable resources need to go out to our kids that need it the most. Uh, but I do believe that there's still a basic uh, component to all, all schools having um, basic services um, and access to basic services regardless. So I think, um, you know, outside of equitable, and you have a good start with this with your opportunity index, but outside of getting resources equitably out, it's also very important that you are um, creating basic services in all of your schools. Um, otherwise, then you don't have equity um, for, for everybody. Uh, so that's, that's my philosophy. Uh, as chief state school officer, I was part of a team, a, a part of the board that adopted the 10 uh, equity commitments um, at, at the highest level of state, the 50 state chiefs. Uh, Tony Evers, who's now governor of Wisconsin, led that in his presidential campaign, and the board adopted those 10 equity commitments, and there was a team of ch chiefs that got together um, and designed those. I wasn't part of that team, but part of the board that adopted and worked on those and part of the conversations that uh, led to us doing that project around creating these um, 10 equity commitments. So now every state has those to be able to reflect and to have a core principles across states. Imagine if all states are looking at 10 core key commitments around equity. It was the first time ever that at that level it's been done, and so I'm very proud of that work as well. Um, and then we use those within our own accountability system to work with the community to make our own definition of equity at the State Department of Minnesota, and then also um, have you know been very visible about our 10 equity commitments and making sure that those are vetted at each uh, school district and, and that they're fully aware of what those are um, so that we can have a common language and we can move an entire state rather than just seeing um, pockets of success. That, we, that everybody is making a commitment toward, toward these um, 10 core principles of, of equity. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Do you have a follow-up? The second question pretty much follow what um, my colleague here just uh, uh, raised with you regarding hiring and uh, retention. Now, the sec my second question is diversity. Yes. Diversity nowadays is a lot different from the initial diversity project that uh, Vice President Al Gore initiated yes. way back in the, 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 the 90. Uh, globally speaking, how is diversity uh, in, in your thinking that would apply to not only hiring, retention, upward mobility, and all that, uh, good things for teachers and administrative uh, staff? What are the best practices that you have used uh, in your tenure with other prior uh, commitment in promoting uh, diversity and given the climate of, uh, of the, the, the teacher and uh, the, the teacher in, in Boston, what are the kind of practices of diversity that you think you can bring? Okay. Um. Thank you for that. Um, diversity has, like you said, really changed. Before it was about awareness of racial diversity. Um, now it's more of about what is our uniqueness that we bring and how do we value that and, and work to um, weave it in a, a, a more beautiful tapestry within the community. And uh, uh, the appreciation of the unique um, uh, qualities and talents and gifts and beauty that each person brings uh, to the community, and so that's how I view uh, diversity uh, now, rather than just um, you know black or white issues, or an Asian issue, or a Hispanic issue. There are so many uniquenesses within, for instance, the you know the Asian student group. There are multiple uniquenesses within that. Um, you know, the Vietnamese community is very different than the Hmong community, you know, and so it's really important to know those differences and to value those differences and the Chinese community. And so I, I you know, and even, you know, black community and black African American and East African and how are those differences and what are the language differences that we all have and then how do we appreciate those as assets within the community 
and move that. I think some of that can be done within the school and academics and ethnic studies and understanding within the social studies curriculum and, and uh, really explicitly teaching that with, to children. Um, some of that's done at the teacher level and giving teachers the cultural competence training and understanding um, with their, their own c culture and, and, and backgrounds and what they bring and how they appreciate that of children and how that presents itself within a community. And so um, negotiating all of that is part of um, building a real good, healthy community. I'm fortunately biracial. I'm African American and mostly Lebanese, a quarter Lebanese, an eighth Irish and eighth German, just so you know. Um, I've spent most of my life people asking me, what are you? Um, and you know, when I was a little girl, the, you know, biracial children were not very common. Um, it wasn't, um, people didn't you know, really know what to do with us. Uh, and so I, I feel very blessed to have had that experience growing up biracial because I can navigate and dance within the African American community and I can navigate and dance within my Lebanese uh, family and, um, and it's a beautiful thing. And so I, have, I, I inherit that personally in, in who I am and then I also then have a full appreciation for that um, with those that I interact with and, and work with. Thank you, Mr. Tron. Mr. O'Neill. <coughs> thank you, Mr. Chia. Welcome, Dr. Casilius. Nice to see you again. Um, thank you. And thank you for spending time with us. I want to do a little bit version of that, of that old game called Two Truths and a Lie. Okay. <laughs> and I'm going to switch it up a little bit. And let's talk about two successes and one failure. Okay. And the good, reason being is, I'm sorry? I don't lie, so that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> OK, great. <laughs> Um, so the reason being is we are very clearly looking for a demonstrated record of success. Yep. And you have had an incredibly rich background. You've been in a number of different districts. You've risen to be a senior state education officer. Help me out with a, a couple of areas that you can point to in your background that this is a academic achievement that I drove, I led, and I'm responsible for. This is an operational achievement that I drove, I led, I'm responsible for. And here's one failure that I had on something that I led and, and I learned from. So, and, and I'm interested in, I don't care if it's Memphis, Minneapolis, the state overall, but one area that, one, one, uh, three examples that you feel was something that you led um, and were obviously successful academically, successful operationally, and then one challenge that you had. Okay, well, thank, thank you. you for that. I'll answer the first two. Just kidding. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, in Memphis, um, I was middle school superintendent, and I've got to say uh, that was something I led and something I am so proud of. And every time I think about it, I get such great joy from it um, because I was able to work with an incredibly dynamic group of principals, 31 of them, who were on fire for children and on fire for their communities. And we just, we had such remarkable, remarkable gains that we got attention from ABC World News. It was just an incredible, fun four years of, of just turning around middle schools. And we, we did that specifically by working on our own personal mastery and leadership, um, supporting teachers and making sure that they understood their, cra their um, uh, standards and, and content and by adding rigor across the curriculum. Um, we added in a reading uh, course at sixth grade. We added in world languages. We um, were looking at um, adding in the gateway course, uh, which was the rigorous course for um, getting high school credit. This was at the middle school level. And then we ended corporal punishment. One of the things that I am so personally um, uh, happy for was um, that Carol Johnson put me in charge of that project, the Blue Ribbon Campaign. I mean. Ending corporal punishment was um, a shame-based kind of um, practice in our schools that really permeated everything with the children. And so to change that school culture was just, it, it, it really changed so much for us. I think it was catalytic to, to the overall change. I mean, the academic change was good, but the valuing of t children um, was something that was really quite remarkable. And so that was extremely successful. Um, in terms of operation, we've had to um, operationalize a mixed delivery early childhood system in, in Minnesota. Um, it, it been, it's been a struggle to do that. Uh, we've had some successes at it, so I'll use this one as our success and also uh, our failure. 
Um, early on, it was hard to get the childcare uh, folks engaged in it because there just wasn't enough incentive. And so we had to work very strategically to provide new incentives through the Department of Human Services to provide additional um, uh, payer reimbursements to incentivize the childcare uh, folks to get more engaged in our quality uh, wear system because we had won the race to the top early childhood get, um, a grant. And so we were building that out and, and building out um, that whole quality aware rating system. And there are a couple things that we could have done better. One was we designed the application for parents to apply and we worked with regional administrators on that and that was just a failure. Um, it was way too long for the parents, it was cumbersome, uh, difficult for them to use and so we had to go back and redo the, um, the application for the parents in terms of their, because it kept, it kept kids out of early childhood simply because we made the application too long and too cumbersome for parents. And, um, and we did that also with our integration aid. So sometimes when you, ha when you work in a bureaucracy, it takes a while to change the mindset about let's simplify these and plain language the language. And because there's all of the, the need to be bureaucratic and protectionist because the lawyers will get involved if you don't ask this question right or you don't get this right number or what, no, no offense to uh, you. But um, so there's, <laughs> and, the and that's even with like, if you think about special education paperwork, here's another, um, I wouldn't say it's a failure, but I, as much as I tried and the, I would meet with the governor and he would say, Brenda, what have you done on special ed paperwork? Have you been able to reduce it? And we tried so hard to bring the advocates together to begin to think about um, the, the compliance nature of the paperwork because our teachers were telling us it's keeping us from working with the children. My own sister is a special education uh, aide. And I said, Mary, why don't you go in and become a teacher? And she said, I mean, she, yeah, become a teacher. And she said, no, because I like teaching. Because she, 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 she saw her role as working with children and developing curriculum and working in partnership with the teacher, but the teacher was always out of the room doing meetings and paperwork. And so I would say one of uh, the things that I regret that I wish I could have moved further was the reduction of paperwork for teachers in special education. We just couldn't get the agreement. And I wish we had. I hope Mary Catherine will be able to do that now and, and move it forward. Um, and then um, another improvement we made, and we fixed it, was the application um, for parents in the mixed delivery system. Now, I still don't think it's easy for our parents to navigate because we have CCAP funding, which is the child care assistance program through Human Services. We have Head Start. We have a school readiness program. We have early childhood family education. We have universal pre-K. And we have uh, um, 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 school-based preschool. So we have all of these different avenues that parents can choose for their kids for preschool and I think that can be also cumbersome so the office of the legislative auditor just did a report saying let's find a way to combine some of these efforts around early childhood and let's then streamline that to make it easier like in one application or something for families so that they can navigate the early childhood landscape a little bit better and so I, I, I wish we had had a little bit more pre-thought on that but we were so busy trying to get funding for it and to stop the fighting around having preschool that we didn't really um, take enough time to look at the systems that were embedded. So that was a lesson I learned um, about really being very systemic and think thoughtfully about the governance structure and the systems you set up in order to move early childhood with a parent view and a parent lens. So thank you for that um, example and the attention to how to make things easier for parents and, and teachers. I'd encourage you sometime to look at the work done by Professor uh, Todd Rogers at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. He's okay. a behavioral scientist and has done a lot of work on the impact of easing uh, simple paperwork things, making applications easier and the, the tremendous jump in response rates because of that. So. Uh, a little side thing for you there. Um, <laughs> uh, when you have some free time. When you have some free time, right. Uh, well, we're well, lifelong learners, right? I'd be glad to look at it. We're lifelong yeah. learners, all that's of us, right. aren't we? That's right. So that's a perfect example, Mr. That's Chair. Right. Uh, the second question is, and as you can probably tell, I have a little bit of Boston accent, as a few of my other colleagues <laughs> do. And um, Boston's a tough city. It has a reputation that way. We can be cynical, we can be tough, we can have sharp elbows. 
And we don't exactly um, always show that Midwest nice that we often hear about from the Midwest part of the country, right, that I'm sure you're very familiar with. So my question for you is, why Boston for you? Because you didn't address that uh, too much in your opening remarks. And second of all, how does Boston get to know you and accept you? What, what do you see as the critical steps for Boston to get to know you? Well, why Boston? It's a really good question. Um, obviously, because it's so public that I'm also a candidate in Michigan. Um, and that is because there are a lot of children here that um, need a leader. I've um, gone from paraprofessional, actually I've gone from camp counselor, to working at jo St. Joseph's Home for Abused Neglected Children, to paraprofessional, special education paraprofessional, working with level five emotionally and behavior behaviorally disturbed children, to a teacher, and to school um, leader, to district leader and superintendent, and then commissioner. So I've served in all of those roles over the past 30 years, and I'm looking for a district that is ready to really move the agenda for uh, kids who are vulnerable and who need us to look at not just the academics, but the full specter of their uh, community, a holistic approach. I think mayoral control allows for that, and I'm used to working with an executive. And so I have a lot of experience politically working with a leader. Um, and I was served on the governor's um, um, senior leadership team. And so he would often, in his cabinet, so he'd often call me in on things when he was talking about housing or if he was talking about uh, social services. We would, you know, I'd meet with the social services. He, he saw education because it was such a priority of his as key to everything else. And he saw the education commissioner as responsible for the children of Minnesota. And so I think that it takes um, that level of commitment um, to the children and families within, within the communities. And so I'm used to that structure. So I think that that's one of the things that's very interesting to me. Um, and, and, and that's why I'm interested. Also, there's a lot of wicked smart people here, right? <laughs> Um, it's a brain trust uh, here, and there's a lot of good work already going on. I would, I would go and uh, do, you know, I've been doing research. This has been an incredibly rigorous process, so I've been doing a ton of research because i got to keep up with all these people with doctorates around here. And so um, I've been doing a lot of research and seeing that what's going on in the community, there's so much good work, and I think that it just needs to be um, mo more coherent and more connected. And so I hope I could be able to be a connector to all of the good work already going on to make it more meaningful and more strategic. Um, and then I think if you do that, you get better results for children. And so that's why Boston, um, it's just a great, it's a great opportunity and I think it's ready. Um, I, and I think this mayor is ready. Um, I think the school committee is, is ready and um, I, I hope to be able to navigate those very, um, difficult conversations to be able to bring people to the table and and then move a bold vision forward. Then what did you, as the second part of that had been, what, what, what did you see as the keys to success for Boston to getting to know you? Well, I, uh, get personally getting to know me or getting to know me on my professional side? Well, obviously, but professionally, <laughs> yeah. course, I would assume, right? <laughs> Uh, well, they have to know that I'm a hockey player, so I really enjoy playing <laughs> hockey, and um, I'm, I'm a big hockey fan. That's my personal side of it. I'm a, a strong family mem uh, member and enjoy my family. And then professionally, um, I'm pretty much an open book. You know, I've been a public official now for eight years, so most of my opinions, my philosophies are out there. So I'm sure people have Googled me and, and learned a lot about both my personal history as well as my professional history. And I think, you know, in terms of my Minnesota nice, I, I told a story earlier of um, one of my Memphis principals. Uh, he had been principal for a very long time, and um, I came to his school, and he said, you know, that, that soft, nice stuff isn't going to work here. And, um, and he said, you're going to have to be a little bit tougher if you think you're going to be successful here in Memphis. And similar what I'm hearing in, uh, but then two years later, we you know we're getting good results and we're doing all this professional learning together and everybody's having fun and it's joyful. And he said, okay, so maybe it does work. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I can take the hits and, and roll with them and roll with the punches because we always put children at the center and then it's just, you know, and you just, 
you just work through it. I don't. I have a very thick skin. I don't read the comments, and um, you know I can wake up in the morning and um, you know take it and 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 and, and move on and, and put kids center. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Neill. Vice Chair Alva Davila. <laughs> <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much Thank for um, coming back and interviewing with us. I know it's been a long morning. It's going to be a long day, so we really appreciate your time. Um, my question um, is around uh, community. So I would like to get a sense from you um, what community means to you. And if you could give a specific example from your previous experiences in terms of working on something where you had to bring the uh, community on board along, um, especially something that maybe not everybody agreed on, um, that you would be able to bring people together. So if you could talk about how you would do that and what that would look like and any specific examples. Yeah. So um, I haven't talked much about my Minneapolis experience, and this might go back to um, you know where it was really challenging and difficult. So. Um, uh, we were leading high school redesign and middle school, sec we call it secondary re uh, redesign in Minneapolis public schools for uh, middle and high schools. And it was um, very difficult because we had two schools that were doing really well and the rest of the schools were just kind of okay. And, um, and then we had two schools that were declining enrollment so bad that the, the district was really considering um, in this larger kind of rezoning plan that they were doing to close them. And uh, you know, Closing, closing schools is very challenging and very, and very difficult. And so we decided that we would restart those schools and, and add more rigor across all schools. Um, and we went out to the community, talked about all of the core components of the um, Minneapolis secondary redesign and looked at how do we um, create greater equity across the schools so that all schools could be excellent. Um, and we knew it would take a long time to embed this vision, but the community was, a, was on board with most of it. When we went to drop entrance criteria, um, that was very challenging for particularly one school, one high school, that had um, pretty strict entrance criteria, um, and it became evident that this was not something they wanted to do. And then at the second high-performing school, we were going to create, we created part of the re redesign four key equity components across all schools, which was having advanced placement, having international baccalaureate at all the schools, having um, a career and technical ed programming, and then we have a program in our schools called College in the Schools, which is like your dual uh, enrollment program that we partnered with the University of Minnesota on. So we had those four core programs, and when I presented the data to the school board, um, we could see that, you know, South High School would have, you know, 36 offerings of advanced placement and, and Edison High School had two. And it just didn't make sense to me that some kids had access to these rigorous courses, but everybody didn't. So we had probably, we had very good agreement that on the core four and having those, that greater equity. But when it came to dropping the entrance criteria, we didn't have as much consensus around that. Uh, but that became core to our core values that we said we held around equity and around all children having access. And so the board supported that. And so, but it was still a really difficult and challenging um, uh, decision for particularly one, one school. Um, but we went ahead and the board voted to drop the entrance criteria. And today that school is still a very strong school. It's thriving. Their graduations are up for their kids of color. Kids feel much more part of the community now rather than being, uh, you know, having different uh, programming within the school um, and not having access. And South High never did actually implement the IB program because they had such a strong AP program. So we allowed that um, adaption uh, underneath the overall program. So I think it's just knowing the community in the context and where to push um, and, and where to um, make adjustments if you need to, if they're still getting the rigor. So they had the AP push and they were able then at South High to create uh, equity and drop the entrance criteria for AP classes. And so they were able to uh, move forward with AP for all students. Uh, and they did a good job at that. Thank you. And in those um, conversations, um, when you say the community, can you just be more specific? Yes, yeah, so we had, we had a structure in Minneapolis called area leaders and area um, 
uh, district area parent councils. So we would work through that and we would have town halls and, and work with parent councils. I also went out to the school itself and, and met with parents and community members at the school and held lots of town. And I didn't send a delegate, I actually went out and met with folks. That's important to show up and to have those difficult conversations and lean into them when you're making these hard decisions. Um, so I, I think that that's really uh, important to hear community and to hear their concerns. And then you can make adjustments if you, if you need to um, and reconsider those adjustments because my mind's not made up when I go out to a community. I'm going out authentically to, to listen and to learn from the community. I don't go out with already my mind made up. Um, so I think that that's, that, and they know that, um, but still you may, again, you may have to disagree. If, if the core principles are centered on what's best for students, sometimes the consensus of, of what we have to move forward with is what we've all decided are our core values. And you always wanna be congruent with your core values because kids can see through that. Thank you. Um, and then just my one additional question is, um, can you talk a little bit about um, how you uh, make budget decisions? Like what, um, what do you take into account when you are um, making budget decisions? So like if you were here um, and there are tight resources, like there are anywhere, I don't think we're the only district, um, but just, you don't have to go into huge detail, but I'm just curious to see sure. like What's your, possible? yeah, exactly. What do so. you... It, it really good, a uh, really good question because you know a budget is a reflection of your values. <coughs> Governor also, also always said that a, a, a budget is the reflection of your values, and there was always the expectation that you came to the table with efficiencies. If you were going to be asking for new revenue or new investments, you had to come to the table with some efficiencies. So I think it's knowing where every dollar is spent within the organization and making sure those are prioritized. So when you do go and you talk to uh, the community, they know that you've, you're running lean uh, and you're, you're maximizing all of your dollars equitably um, and then you build that trust with them and then you can ask for a, a bigger ask later. So that's really important. I think, uh, I already said that, I think every dollar should go as close to the classroom as possible um, and close to, close to kids is what I mean. So um, that's really important. Um, and I'm, you know, I, don't, I think you fund everything at the schools and at the classroom level and fund then for student connectedness activities, arts programming after school, and then you fund the, the department. So um, those, are, those are my core values. Well, thank you, uh, Vice Chair. Good afternoon once again. Thanks. Um, so I wanna be brief uh, because I do wanna make sure that we have time to get around for another uh, round of questions from each of my colleagues. But you know, one of the themes that I've caught, um, caught on to quite a bit today with uh, your comments is uh, a sense of collaboration and a duty to uh, collaborate with your colleagues, uh, both within districts and within state education authorities, as well as with the community at large and, and the other decision makers that influence the process. And I noted that um, your, um, the individual that followed you as the commissioner very recently, uh, Mary Catherine Ricker, who you had uh, mentioned earlier, uh, was formerly the head of the AFT in uh, Minnesota. And so you had a, a long relationship with her and she's been very supportive of you and complimentary of your work there. And so I wonder, um, maybe you could talk a little bit about uh, what your specific relationship has been with uh, teachers and teacher unions over your career, uh, both at the state level as well as within um, the various uh, districts that you've worked within. Well, thank you. I consider myself first a teacher. I didn't spend as much time in the classroom as many teachers here, so I defer to their excellence and I don't try to pretend that I've been in the classroom recently and I know it's very different than when I was in the classroom, <coughs> but I do believe in uplifting teachers, uplifting the profession. I try to get into classrooms and visit as much as I can. Um, I especially like reading to preschoolers. <laughs> That's my favorite thing to do. But I had a very good working relationship with the union. We didn't always agree on things, but you work through uh, all of those things. You put kids center and, and um, it, it works. We had very respectful relationship. There were most of the policies we saw eye to eye because I believe in having teachers voice at the table uh, when, when you make decisions. And so that was also a priority of the governor's and a priority of mine. Uh, when we passed teacher evaluation, um, I didn't agree with putting in test scores, but again, you have to agree with stuff that you don't agree to, or agree to that you don't agree with. 
Um, but we made sure that we put a majority of teachers on the working committee that designed that teacher evaluation so that then we could make sure that the local school districts had a nice guide and a nice framework for which to work. Um, and, and, um, and so that's kind of how I've worked with teachers. Um, then just personally, like as a superintendent, it's about valuing their work. It's about uh, being up on the latest craft and um, being able to talk the talk of teachers, uh, which I can do because uh, I really do study what the best practices are out there and try to lead in that area um, and, and try to observe teachers and understand better um, their struggles and their work. Um, and so I've, I've had, I, I have a really good relationship with teachers, with unions, um, understand contract negotiations, labor management, progressive discipline, all of that. I mean, and so, and I would say that even in progressive discipline, which is kind of the thornier issue, like why would someone in an interview be talking about progressive discipline with teachers? Um, because it's important, because if you have ineffective teachers, you need to give teachers an opportunity to improve, but if they don't improve, then everybody wants to have effective teachers in the classroom, teachers especially, hmm. um, because they carry the burden of teachers who are not prepared to be good, uh, good teachers for children, and they get to watch it when they're not. And, it, and it, it's very hard for teachers to watch other teachers um, and oftentimes they end up carrying a larger burden in that those, the principals start taking the kids out of the class and putting them in their classes so then they have higher class sizes. <laughs> um, uh, or they close a whole art program because they don't want to do the progressive discipline just to get rid of the art teacher, which is absolutely ridiculous. And so I think that um, it's working with principals so that they understand how to work with teachers who are not as effective as we'd like them to be and then actually working through their due process rights. Um, which I strongly believe in. I think everybody, you know, has a right to their due process rights. Um, so I think because I've had that, um, when I've had to let teachers go, I've had that respectful um, um, tendency toward the due, the due process of it that I've gotten a lot of respect from the union around that. Um, and, 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 and everybody leaves with their dignity no matter what, which is really important too. It's always about the children and about who's going to be in front of our kids. And so that's a that's a um, restorative view or a corrective view rather than a punitive view. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. I mean, I you know, very innovative thing that I would like to see happen is, you know, teachers who who it's not a good fit for them. Well, where is the right fit for them? Because it's not that they came into teaching where they didn't have a mission for children and they didn't love children. They knew they were going to work be working with children. It's just not the right fit. Mm -hmm. So it's important to see. Maybe it's just that it's not the right fit at middle school and they're assigned to middle school. Maybe they'd be a better elementary teacher. Maybe they'd be a better high school teacher. Maybe that within their license they're a better um, counselor or they're a better whatever. You know, where is their best fit? And, and where will they be able to feel self-efficacy as well as children will get what they need? Thank you. Uh, so I, I heard as well uh, a little earlier you sp uh, touched on uh, issues of opportunity achievement gaps and, and how to collaborate within the schools um, and with our partners uh, across other fields such as health, uh, public housing, public health, uh, so on and so forth. You know, that's one um, view on how, you know, we work externally outside of the district, outside of the four, corner, the four walls of a school. Um, to help support our students, but you know, you've had a lot of experience in working uh, with the legislature over your time as commissioner as well. And um, well, Minnesota is a very progressive state. It's got, um, I, I think, some might describe it as a purple state uh, because there is a diversity of, of parties and opinions in in um, in the state. And so, you know, I, I've read a little bit about uh, the work that you've done with the legislature, and and much to some of the earlier questions around um, some successes, some setbacks uh, you've had. Uh, some interesting um, uh, work to do, particularly on the civil rights arena, um, LGBT rights uh, with uh, the legislature in Minnesota. I'm, I'm setting all this up for the context of we've got right now in the Commonwealth a very um, um, uh, public debate around how we fund our schools going forward, how we provide our schools with the proper resources so that we can provide those wraparound services uh, to get our kids ready for school. And uh, so I want to hear a little bit about how you bring folks to the table. How do you, how do you rally uh, folks, especially in a legislative ses um, setting, around an issue um, that can unite us on a path forward to, uh, to get us to where we need to be with respect to funding our schools properly? 
Yeah, well, thank you for that. Actually, um, I very much enjoy leaning into the difficult conversations and being up at 3 a.m. trying to pass policy. <laughs> um, it, it, so when we first came into office, the governor was handed a $6 billion deficit. And he had promised, and uh, we don't make promises we can't keep, that he would put more money in education every year he was governor, no exceptions, no excuses. And by the end of the two terms, he had put in a billion dollars and paid, or two billion dollars and paid back two billion dollars that was owed to the schools. So he definitely delivered on that. That was not easy. Um, and we also had more equitable funding so that we were able to bring down the disparity among our uh, low wealth districts from 31% down to 18% between the richest and the poorest districts. That was intentional with some of the things we did around levies and around referendums and equalization of AIDS, as well as in additional American Indian revenue that we were able to get. We found that our, our tribal schools were getting about 50% of the funding as any other Minnesota kid. So we placed uh, equ equitable funding and equalization so that they would get the same amount of funding as uh, any other Minnesota kid was getting, even though it was really the federal responsibility to be able to fund those schools. Um, we were able to move EL funding from five years to seven years because the research showed that EL students needed to have more funding. So we looked at those equitable pots. We didn't delink our compensatory revenue, meaning that if enrollment goes up or if special ed or poverty goes up, that compensatory, which was poverty revenue, also went up. And so um, really becoming an expert in the budgetary um, statutory language and trying to lever every single dollar that we can for equity purposes and for specific students that were not achieving at the levels that we want was critical. So we were able to really leverage our funding pieces um, even within deficits, even within full Republican control and the um, governor, I was appointed to a Democratic governor. So I'm, I'm speaking in the context of a Democratic um, viewpoint of what our priorities were compared with, a Rep and I don't do it disrespectfully, compared to what the Republican uh, policies were at the time, which were very, very different um, priorities. Mm -hmm. So we're sitting, we actually went to special session and from special session went to shutdown um, to be able to get some of the things that we were fighting for in terms of the increases in our per pupil formula. We wanted to make sure that there were increases in early childhood, at least to get a start on our early childhood and to begin to think uh, more strategically about how we are funding our schools around equity. So that, that was key in the first couple years and that had full Republican control. We also um, were able to do policy in that. Um, we worked, the governor actually worked really closely with the K-12 Senate chair um, to put together a Read Well by Third Grade initiative. They both wanted, this was on our seven point plan, it was a critical and important, but I couldn't, couldn't get agreement on how to do the, do the third grade uh, literacy bill. So a Republican K-12 chair in the House, uh, Sandra Erickson, worked with me with Pam Myra, who was a re uh, representative who was sponsoring the legislation, who was stuck on remedial edu uh, uh, retaining kids. And um, I, I don't support retaining children. Uh, so we were trying to figure out how are we going to get beyond this kind of sticking point. And it was the Republican K-12 policy chair who came in and helped neg negotiate that. That kind of set the relationship that we had then moving forward the next eight years. And so when she was in control or when she was in the minority, we always would work together. We didn't always agree, but we respected each other and we worked together on those things that we could move forward because the, the underlying principle was what can we make progress on? How do we move and make progress on this legislative um, agenda for kids, even in the ways that we disagree? Um, so I think that's kind of the principle and how I work with the legislature. I have a big, big healthy respect for what they do. They have a ton of competing priorities uh, that come at them, um, but working through the K-12 chairs and really building a relationship with them, whether they're Republican or Democrat, was really critical. And it was very different working with Republican legislature than working with a full Democratic legislature. And you would think that would be easier, but sometimes it's just not and then working with divided government with the Republican and the, um, this is the purple nature of my state, Republican and uh, Democrat, and then now fully Republican, we were back, and then now we're split again. We're the only legislature in the entire nation right now that's split Republican and Democrat. Mm -hmm. um, and we try to come together uh, around the issues of children and move forward, and our whole mentality was, let's just move forward and make progress. 
let's get something done um, for children. Very good. Thank you very much. Yeah. So uh, we're, I think we have about 45 minutes uh, remaining. So we've uh, got time to go around once again with uh, my colleagues. And I'm going to ask uh, our student representative to uh, lead us in this round of questioning. I think we'll ask each uh, member to come up with one more question and then we'll leave enough time for you to have a closing statement. Okay. Hi again. Hi. Um, so it is important to recognize that you would be joining us from the outside. Um, and sort of considering that, I would like to know if you have questions for our community that would help you understand our needs and our challenges better and how you fit into the fabric of our, our work um, as a district. So in other words, do you know what you don't know? Um, <laughs> and how do you go about <laughs> finding that out? Now, Evelyn, how would I know what I don't know? <laughs> I know enough to know that I don't know. Yeah. So that's good. Um, so I would um, work with everyone and have really good conversations with them about what their hopes and dreams are. I would like to know what they've done and tried that, they, that has worked and what they've done and tried that hasn't worked. Well, what should we stop doing and what should we continue to do? This is both for the student perspective as well as teacher and principal and uh, community perspective. So I would be trying to gauge and ask questions. Well, tell me more about that. Why, why did it work? Or um, is that something we should scale up? Or is there a new innovation that's needed? Um, if there's new ideas, what, what have you thought through? Have you thought through all of the different context and nature and the unintended consequences if you do do that? What kind of impact would that have on poor communities or this uh, racial community or this neighborhood uh, if you made that change? So those are the kinds of questions that I would ask. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Reyes. Dr. Rivera. So one of the uh, issues that you know our district is facing is declining enrollments. Um, some of that's due to uh, gentrification um, and lack of affordable housing in communities like East Boston. Um, so you know schools like East Boston Hive, you know, lost hundreds of kids and. But we're also losing um, Boston public school students to charter schools. Mm -hmm. um, and that's an issue in our state that um, is complex. And um, I just wanted you to speak a little bit about, um, you mentioned um, that you, in, in, your, in your CV, that you had a successful partnership between um, a charter school and a, and a private school. Um, what are your yeah? What are your overall thoughts about charter schools, and what can you, how can you help us fix um, that sort of dynamic of of draining you know sort of our students leaving BPS and going to charter schools? Yeah. Well, thank you for that question. Let me clarify the partnership. Uh, we had a partnership with North High School and Dunwoody School, and we were working through embedding a, a new model at the school. I don't think that it was successful and sustained. Um, we attempted to try to create this partnership, and it was working for a while, but I don't think it's still in it working, so I just want to be clear with that. Um, so I think it's important to partner with, um, with uh, you know, community and higher ed and, if, if appropriate, charter sector um, to create opportunities for, for children. Um, I don't have a uh, personal, um, like, angst against charters or anything. So um, I, I don't want to blame them for the declining enrollment that's happening. I think we need to create quality across the sector. Um, and so I think that it's important for us to give parents options that are of high quality to, um, to their students. And so I think that um, you know, making new investments in East Boston would be really important. Um, and I think uh, making sure that it had the right rigor, level of rigor, or the right support systems in place for students. If it had a, a large EL population, it would be important to have those support services for families so that they felt um, that they, their kids were getting what they need. I'd look at the connectedness and uh, opportunities for kids in after school programming. Um, so all of those things matter in terms of the competitive nature of um, enrollment and choice and where parents are choosing. So my principles are more about um, making sure that you have high quality schools in every neighborhood um, and uh, high quality options for parents. 
I personally always sent my children to the neighborhood public school um, up until the most <coughs> recent year of my son's um, schooling where he opened and enrolled to a, a specific science school. Um, but otherwise, I, all my kids have gone to their neighborhood public school. Thank you, Dr. Rivera. Mr. Tron. And there's a story with that as well, with, with moving my children to our neighborhood school because it was a, on the state's lowest performing school list. Um, and my kids did attend the highest performing elementary school. But because the school district changed their zones, I felt to have integrity as an associate superintendent and then to have parents move their zones for me to keep my kids at the high achieving school when I moved to the neighborhood of the lowest, one of the lowest achieving schools in the state. I couldn't just keep my kids at the high achieving school, so I moved my kids to the lowest mm. achieving school and became part of the change at that school. Okay. And they're doing great now. <laughs> uh, among the answers that you provided us today, you did touch upon uh, due process, uh, restorative, uh, um, in, uh, restorative procedures in resolving disputes. Uh, Aside from the union uh, uh, protocol or whatever we have here uh, dealing with teachers' issues, there are at times incidents that occurred uh, in Boston Public School that may require outside intervention, um, sometimes fe federal intervention as well, or state intervention. Um, what I'm looking at is your global view again. I'm, I'm talking about global. I, 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 I'm more interested in the global view of a candidate in this position. That's my take. Okay. What is your global view in terms of creating or having created support um, procedures in resolving disputes between community and school, students and teachers, students and schools, um, and maybe communities versus communities. Okay. Um, so I, there's a little bit difference I'm picking up in your question. One was around like performance management, the difference between performance management and also then discipline for a teacher. Those are, to me, those are two different things. And then the disputes in, is, a, is a different aspect of managing kind of conflict. And so I'll answer the first one if I'm correct that you're asking about that in terms like those incidents that come up with, with, um, with, were you saying that there's incidents that come up with employees potentially that are, are discipline issues or was uh, I understanding the first part of that question? Well, the, 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 uh, the issues regarding disciplining uh, uh, staff. Yes, uh, okay. we, we have the available right. uh, resources. I just wanted to I'm, make sure. I'm I looking, I, uh, th thank you for, for clarifying that. I'm looking for a more global view in dealing with issues that ar arose in school, uh, let's say with, res with respect to civil rights, okay. with respect to uh, other kind of uh, um, other kind of uh, procedural laws, let's say, okay. uh, rather than substantive law. Those are the kind of issues that arose that sometimes uh, gotten uh, involved the involvement of uh, outside uh, arenas, okay. forums. As a superintendent, of course, uh, the, the first duty. Uh, among the prior, uh, you know, uh, pri uh, primary duties of a, of a superintendent is to work with the, with us mm -hmm. as well as you know uh, responsible agencies. What are the the, 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 the procedure or what are the the means that you, that you think that you can add to uh, to expedite these or to resolve these with human dignity yeah. as well as with the restorative? I, I like yeah. the restorative uh, Justice. thinking. Yeah. And uh, so that's, that's my, my main okay. point. Well, thank you very much for that. I think I'll take your advice and do kind of the global. I think there's preventative measures you can do to set a culture um, in, the, in, the, in the organization around these and be very clear what the procedures are for 
uh, complaints and for um, procedures for understanding and then uh, discipline procedures. And then if there are disputes, then you would do that through a d appeal process. I would, uh, I would suspect there's an EEOC um, plan here in the district, and if not, there should be, um, in terms of uh, outlining uh, your, your thoughts about uh, human rights and about um, equal opportunity for everybody. Uh, and so if those complaints bubble up, then your human, re re human um, rights official, if you have one at the district, or your human uh, resources officer would handle those uh, complaints and then, uh, or issues or concerns, yet whether it's a performance management issue or whether it's an incident that occurred. Um, sometimes it, someone may have to be put on administrative leave and there may have to be some fact finding um, that happens and then there could be the, the decision to made to have a, an external evaluator come in and really observe and, and uh, try to do some more investigatory uh, findings of what occurred and what that incident actually was um, before you issue any kind of discipline or, um, or fire somebody. Uh, so, and that should be in, in alignment with whatever your policies are uh, with, your, with your plan around equal opportunity. Uh, I hope that answered your question. And then, and then the employee would have an opportunity then for an appeals process. I think this would be similar for the community if, they, if there was an incident that happened within the community that was um, um, egregious and, and it was violating some policy we had around equal opportunity, respect for diversity, or a racial incident that happened, we would do some initial fact finding. It may cause for us to have to do some um, uh, putting the employee on administrative leave and then doing a greater investigatory and then having our human resource professionals uh, involved in terms of investigating that issue and then issuing whatever is the appropriate level of discipline for, for that incident. I, I hope I answered that. I'm not sure if I, I'm completely understanding your question. But no, I, I appreciate thank you. It. Thank you, Mr. Tron. We're going to go back to uh, Ms. Robinson now. Thank you. Um, since Carol Johnson left in 2013, we've now, this, as we go into from 2013 to now, this will be the fourth new superintendent. Oh. So we've had superintendents, two interims and one. And so the question is, how would, if you were chosen to be superintendent, thinking about this sort of transitional past, what would be your priorities to start anew, continue, move forward? Where would be your priorities if you would begin this new superintendency? Mm -hmm. Well, they, it's an important question because leadership that changes often is very um, difficult for the staff because uh, they don't know what to trust and what's really going to be done and what direction they're going. And so that they're kind of all over the place and there's little coherence. Um, and so I think it's really important to have um, a consistency of leadership. And so I am looking for consistency. If I come, I want to stay for a while. I'm looking for a capstone to my career. <laughs> so that's why it's really important to... Um, to, to know that about me as I come in. It's not like I'm coming for two years. I'm not looking for to send to something else. I've already been commissioner. You know, I don't, I, you know, I'm looking to get back into the work as a practitioner uh, and, to, and to do this alongside a community and to be a community. I actually miss being part of a community um, and working with children and families. And so that, to me, and I also want to be part of leveraging a larger system uh, within a community uh, to, to be holistic for children and families. And so that, that to me is really important. What I would do is to begin, I think I said this earlier, uh, would begin to have the conversations about what has been done in each of those administrations because I think it's important to take an accounting because so often administrators come in and they don't take an accounting of what has been done beforehand, especially what has each one tried to attempt to do and how embedded and how uh, well was that executed? Was it a worthy idea that just was poorly executed because they left too soon? Or was it, um, was it something that really they probably shouldn't have done anyways and it was just a pet project of the administrator who came in? So I think that it's trying to take an assessment of what has actually um, been done and then try to understand what's worth continuing to do. What should we take off the table and just stop doing 
Um, and that's probably a lot of things to be able to create efficiency and focus um, and then begin to craft over the next year what the core work will be for the next, I, I told the search committee the next 13 years. <laughs> And they said, 13? <laughs> well, that's thinking of the preschoolers that are coming in that will graduate in 13 years. Um, so, and it probably will take that long to build it. I mean, I don't, I don't want to come in here saying, oh, yeah, we're going to get the kind of results we got in Memphis. Um, you know, I, I want to see progress, and I want to see results start turning around. Um, and I want to see um, measurable results, and I expect to be held accountable to that if I'm uh, selected as superintendent. But for the real systemic work, I think that's needed, it will take many years, many years. And sustained effort from the community and a sustained um, persistence and perseverance because it will be political, it will be challenging um, and, and difficult at times, but it will also be so worthy. And I think people will be inspired by the work even when we have bumps. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. Dr. Coleman. Great, thank you. Um, um, my last question is, in, in 2019, uh, how do you think a focus on racial and economic um, integration in schools is still a rel relevant strategy for closing the achievement gap? Well, Dr. Coleman, I uh, was the superintendent of East Metro Integration District, and I also was an assistant principal who started an integration school. So I believe strongly in integration as a core strategy to um, improving outcomes for children. And um, I just think that you know students who learn from each other and can appreciate each other's differences are great. Now, do I think we should bus kids all around the city? That has not worked. But there are ways that, um, that you can get at integrated schools, I think, creatively, so that children have the opportunity to interact with, with a unique, beautiful, uh, Dispora that you have here in the city, so um, I would I would want to encourage that whether it meant uh, putting more field trips out and having more opportunities at camp experiences and summer experiences or more academic programming or having students uh, at the high school level interact more together. I mean, there's all kinds of ways to create integrated learning environments for children that are not also just so dependent on brick and mortar, and that's for all kinds of learning. So. Just creating opportunities for kids to interact with uh, uh, children that do not look like them, maybe don't worship like them, um, is a great way for us to create a really rich and beautiful uh, community of, of children and citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Coleman. Mr. O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Dr. Casilius, I found it interesting when I asked you for a, uh, something that you pointed to as an achievement. You talked about when you were the head of middle schools in Memphis. And you talked about putting investments in, and um, I believe you felt that you improved academic achievement in Memphis. And I'm putting that against uh, what's going on in Boston, where we have actually been moving away from middle schools. We struggled with finding research to show that middle schools were improving. We found some research that says a K to 6, 7 to 12 model works, other research that says K to 8, 9 to 12 model works. Nothing that said the middle schools were working, and we're actually moving uh, away from that. You probably know in your research and build BPS that we have, I think it's like 23 grade configurations in Boston, um, and we're trying to cut that down, have less transitions for parents, have more certainty. Uh, that is partly to get at what Dr. Rivera was talking about, of parents uh, moving to charter schools because they don't like the um, uncertainty of the number of transitions. And so as we work to keep this portfolio approach, but more towards K to 6, 7 to 12, or K to 8, 9 to 12, allow parents to have a choice, have a range of both, help me out with your thoughts about Build BPS. And, and again, specifically with regards to, here you were saying one of your achievements was about middle school, and yet we're moving against that. So in that context, how will you envision the work of Build BPS? This will be challenging. Um, as we change grade, con grade configurations and reinvest in buildings. So I, I want to flip it now over to you and, and get your thoughts on that topic. So thank you for that. And I am a strong proponent of middle schools um, and middle school philosophy. But I support less transitions. So I think with a 7 through 12, you avoid the transitions and you really put the value on the relationships. So families 
get to um, go to school from 7 to 12 or 6 to 12 or whichever it ends up being. Um, and they get to develop the relationship with the adults and have consistency there. Within that structure, you can create teams and you can create a middle school philosophy within that structure where you have students assigned to teams of teachers. You have high rigor because a lot of times when we first started middle school reform, there was kind of this, let's focus on the social emotional aspects of the you know, adolescent years, which is so important in terms of child development and child development outcomes. But also it's a time when uh, children are the most curious. It's a time when they're exploring their own uh, autonomies and the challenging the, the assumptions of their parents. And so you can build an environment, a smaller environment within a larger uh, school system that does all of the principles of a middle school model, but within the context so that then the adults feel more comfortable in terms of the transitions and the relationships that they build at the school and how they support their kids, like with the counselor. They'll know who the counselors are. They'll know who the principal is. And that makes it more comfortable for a family structure, but for the individual student, then you would work through teaming and work through adding uh, the core principles of middle school philosophy within a larger structure of a middle and high school. Thank you. So that, that's helpful. Also, your thoughts on Build BPS. Uh, obviously, you've done your research on it, um, and it, there's a lot of great stuff coming, right? We're going to yeah. be investing a billion dollars in our schools. We'll be building, we're already starting to build a bunch of new ones, putting uh, 21st century furniture and equipment in a bunch of our school buildings, but it will also be the challenges as we move schools around. So your thoughts on those challenges ahead, please? Yes, thank you. I think Build BPS is a good start. It'll probably be that you actually end up investing more because the community will be so excited about the work. And, and um, it'll be that over the years, you'll see new opportunities for what will be happening with the Build PPS model and how you get your, it's, it's actually fueling your budgetary um, um, requests and how you're looking at your vision and how you're enacting your vision and how you're creating greater equity across the schools. And I think that with Build PPS, you have the opportunity to take this kind of facility plan and have that undergird as a foundation the core work of equity. And so that's why I'm really excited about the Build PPS plan as a, as a way to look at the conversations about the structure of, of the work and how that builds kind of a scaffold for the, for, the, for the core work to happen around instruction, around pedagogy, around programming, and the opportunities that you're going to have for children. Um, so within that framework, I think it provides an opportunity for the deeper conversation to have about what kind of academic programming and um, uh, co-curricular programming that you offer for children. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Herneal. I want to take an opportunity to look around at my fellow members and see if there's any further questions that we haven't yet been able to get to. There is actually Mr. one topic that I do not believe has come up today, and uh, so I apologize, Mr. Chair, but we haven't talked about special ed at all today. Yes, yeah. sir. Mm -hmm. You were going to go there as well, right? right. Yeah. And, and so <laughs> what I would like to ask is we have a stated policy of this committee to increase inclusive opportunities for our students. Very good. Help me out, please, with your interpretation of the balance of how to do inclusion right versus inclusion fast. What's your experience with it, and how can we do inclusion right? So um, thank you for that. I think that um, doing inclusion right means preparing the field for, um, for um, kids. So for instance, I think that BPS offers uh, programming for special education students at the secondary level, but most of them go to five of the comprehensive schools. And I think if you're gonna you know, dismantle that, you've gotta make sure that the teachers are ready to handle and work through all of the myriad of uh, disabilities that students bring and, and the unique challenges that come and the complexity of those needs. You can't just treat one student with autism like another student with autism. You have to work with the family on the particular ways that that child presents um, and um, get, the, get the appropriate training in place and the appropriate plans and revisit the IEPs in the new structure of whatever you're going to do in terms of the inclusionary model. So I think getting it right means that you've prepared the field. You've, you've um, prepared the teachers. You've spoken with the um, parents uh, around the needs of their child in particular. You've looked at their goals. Um, you've rewritten their IEPs, and you get ready for them to come. Uh, you don't just say, oh, we're going to do it to do it, and then the children come and, and nobody knows how to handle it. Um, and, and then kids don't get the services that they need. So um, 
that's, that's what I would do in looking at it, really trying to understand that. I don't want to make it sound like I didn't have another question. I just want to point out, just for your uh, comfort level, that you did ask answer my four questions, which is autonomy and accountability, the importance of human capital. I really appreciate your value of the teachers. That's very important. Uh, Value-driven strategic planning, I think, is a wonderful approach. So I really want to say I appreciated that, not that we didn't have more questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Coleman, and thank you, uh, Mr. O'Neill and, and Ms. Robinson as well. I, I think um, you know we'll, you'll have an opportunity to make a, um, a final. Um, I'm sorry. Is there s something else? Or? I, I, as you had said, uh, Ms. Robinson and I will both start to talk about special ed. So I just kind of turned to her quietly and said, "Did that answer your question as well?" And she said, "Well, kind we of." Do so. have a follow up, please. So we do have the time. I just wanted a little bit more information about your approach to expansion of early childhood. I know that you did that as a commissioner, so the question is, you know that we're investing in a um, mixed delivery system here. Yes. What are your thoughts about that and how to move forward? Yes, well, thanks for that. Um, uh, of course, my whole background uh, professionally as a practitioner has been uh, in um, middle and high school. Mm -hmm. uh, so I didn't have any experience with that before becoming commissioner. And then for the past eight years, I've had to ignore middle and high school because my governor was really interested in early childhood and all day kindergarten. So I've spent the past eight years learning about preschool to, to grade eight uh, frameworks, uh, worked across the, uh, with the associate uh, elementary, um, association of elementary school principals to work on their leadership around uh, early childhood initiatives, worked with the Minnesota Reading Corps around their initiatives and work, um, this, these are policy and funding as well as setting up professional development and trainings through, with my staff with the elementary um, work, got preschool development grant, got the early childhood grant, work, work to help uh, support, my, my staff and team work to help support the Promise Neighborhoods and the Transformation Zones, um, worked across sector to support the mixed delivery system, put out a quality awareness system, a reporting system for parents to be able to find and access uh, early learning opportunities. Um, and so we w did the funding side, we did the policy side, as well as the implementation side of a mixed delivery system. Um, we had strong arguments around whether you do scholarship-based um, uh, preschool opportunities for children and you get the money to the most at-risk kids, um, or whether you do universal preschool. My governor had a strong opinion of universal preschool. We didn't want to create segregated classrooms with, you know, socioeconomically segregated classrooms of kids with, you know. Um, so he really supported a universal preschool approach and advocates really supported scholarship approach. Um, and so he did all of it. He funded our scholarships and um, put money in that. He funded universal preschool. And when we couldn't get agreement on e an expansion on universal preschool, we developed a program called School Readiness Plus, which then focused on at-risk three-year-olds and then also gave additional um, choice to school districts to design their own programs around whether they had uh, school-based uh, preschool or whether they worked across sector within their communities uh, through a transformational zone kind of model to uh, collectively invest either in Head Start and give the money that they were granted it to Head Start or whether it was to give additional funding to, um, to child care within the community. Um, and so we did that really because in many of our rural districts we had child care deserts and so there really wasn't opportunity to have um, preschool in child care, um, home, home and neighbor. We were, uh, so we had to invest in the schools in those communities. But in other communities, they had really strong, like Duluth Public Schools, they did all their preschool uh, with Head Start. Um, so really important to give that flexibility. So I kind of liked that school readiness mindset of giving the local school district control over whether they were uh, doing a mixed delivery model, whether it was school-based model and what would work best for them within their community. Um, so we did that. We also set up the children's cabinet and worked across agency for the governance model of that. And uh, that became more codified. We moved it out of the Department of Education and brought it to the governor's office to elevate that and to be able to give uh, more, more attention to the governance so that we could coordinate better among us, which was an office, that, which was a finding that I shared with uh, um, Mr. O'Neill, you know, that that's something we needed to, we need to still continue to work at in terms of simplifying that for parents and navigation. So, and also I'll just say I'm a Head Start baby. 
Okay. <laughs> um, so I, I know Head Start works. And uh, we, we invested in Head Start too. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. Dr. Rivera has a question, then Mr. O'Neill. Thank you again for the opportunity to ask another question. Um, yeah, we, another thing we haven't talked about is the arts. Oh. Um, and I'm curious what kinds of investments um, you made in promoting the arts. Uh, we, we definitely have some arts deserts in some of our schools. Um, so, and we had a very powerful uh, testimonies um, in, a, in a, one of our school hearings from students from various um, you know, schools, BAA, um, and high school task force. So just curious, uh, again, what could you, how would you promote the arts in our schools? So thank you for that. Um, as the mother of a future art teacher, um, I love the arts. Uh, all three of my children are incredibly creative, um, and my son is just incredible. My, my, my youngest son is an incredible artist, uh, claymation, animation, uh, storytelling, and screenwriting. And my, do my middle daughter, who's now in college, is an artist and just got second place for her art exhibit. So I'm super proud of her at, um, in college. And then um, my oldest son, who's 30, he uh, is a creative videographer and a photographer. And so he's, he's an artist. So this is something that's really uh, personal and important to me personally around the arts. I want to commend Superintendent Perel and her work with the arts and arts integration throughout the district. I think she's doing great work um, leading in this area. And I think that students are connected to their world through their expression, and many times that's artistic expression. And so I love the arts. I would also say we haven't talked about physical wellness and PE. Uh, I think all the PE teachers in Minnesota would uh, come after me if I didn't talk about the importance of PE and United PE. They were at every single, uh, every student succeeds act as we talked about a well-rounded education and what it means around wellness. And I think that well-being and wellness are really critical to our children um, and their mental health and uh, their physical well-being. And so I think that um, PE is important. And then, of course, I don't ever want to make uh, the librarians upset either. So having libraries uh, and the value of libraries is also really important. So we'll make sure we touch on everything. Um, but um, in terms of um, PE and art, um, there's some uh, it's really, really important for student connectedness to be able to have those expressive uh, opportunities within, within their academic programming. And I consider those academic. Thank you, Dr. Rivera. Mr. O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Don't forget the school, school nurses and the uh, student psychologists. I talked psychologists. about that already, though, so don't get them mad at me. Okay, yes. School counselors. I school counselors, 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 the psychologists. It's, counselors, it's about the and physical nurses. and emotional health of That's all of right. our students. They cannot be in a position to learn until those are taken care of. Um, a couple of quick questions. How did you end up working in Memphis? I assume you were recruited there by Dr. Johnson? Yes, so um, I was in it's St. Okay. Paul. I, hold on, just one it Just I just want to clarify that. You yes. were recruited there by Dr. Johnson. Yes, because she was the superintendent of Minneapolis Public Schools, and okay. actually Carol Johnson recruited me from St. Paul Schools to come to Minneapolis. Okay. And then when I was in Minneapolis, she gave me one of her hardest schools to turn around. Um, and then when I was, then I had been at that school for four years, and so she then asked me to come to Memphis. She actually, I had been an assistant principal for nine years. And so she knew, and it was during a time of budget cuts. And I was an African-American female who looked like I was about 21. Uh, still, even nine years after being assistant principal, and now I'm starting to look my age, but before I didn't. And it was a very male-dominated um, uh, position in, in, in Minnesota, the high school principalship. So Carol asked me to come to Memphis, and she asked me to come to turn around one middle school. And so I was really thrilled to go to Memphis and to get one of these really tough schools to turn around. And then she brought me mid-year, and I was her personal assistant at that time, and I helped her kind of work through um, putting together the Title I consolidated plan, the plan for middle school turnaround and what we would do to turn around schools in middle school and coordinating those conversations and what we would do with the 22 corrective action schools that the state was saying they wanted to take over. And she was saying, please give me an opportunity to come up with a plan to 
to deal with. I look, I just got here. And so she had me kind of help her with some of these um, larger plans to start with the community engagement and start working uh, collaboratively to understand better kind of what direction to take. And then as I was working with her much more closely at the district level, she knew of my work at the school level um, and being able to execute and, and, and turn around schools. So when she brought me to Memphis, I was gonna do that in one school, but then I started working with her more closely and she saw things within me that I didn't even see within myself in terms of my own personal leadership. And um, she then came to me in my office one day and said, um, I've been looking for a middle school superintendent and the person's sitting right in front of me and I'd like you to lead our middle schools. I said, are you crazy? I came down to be a principal and you want me to lead 31 middle schools? And, um, and, but she, she believed I could do it. And, and it was one of my most rewarding professional opportunities I've ever had in my career. And I believe it's because it's, and I learned so much uh, under her. So I asked that question, and by the way, thank you. I joined school committee or um, applied to join school committee to support Dr. Johnson's work um, on alternative education yeah. and re-engaging students and lowering the dropout rate. Yeah. And there's a special place in my heart for that woman. And um, my guess is she's watching right now. So <laughs> hello, Dr. Johnson. Thank you. The lower graduation rate is a lot of uh, work that you started. Uh, but uh, more importantly, having been recruited by her from St. Paul to join Minneapolis and then by her to join Memphis, I'm interested in your thoughts about building your own team should you be chosen to be superintendent. And how do you balance between having Boston expertise, Boston knowledge, and bringing in people such as Dr. Johnson did with you clearly in, in two different circumstances. Um, I, you know, Dr. Johnson always said that building a team is both an art and a science. And so I think that you would have to look within first and have the conversations within the organization and find the talent. And um, you know, that may be some of the existing team members, it may be all of them, it may be some of them. Um, and then you know, trying to figure out who, who has a, who wants to get into this work? I mean, because it's hard work. It's going to be hard work, um, and it's going to take the right kind of leadership in order to move it. And they're going to have the right kind of moral leadership and and um, and capacity in which to really um, put their own ego aside and um, and move the work forward for the, the good of everybody. And so I'm I'm kind of a workhorse that puts my head down, and I look for people who are highly qualified who have a high moral uh, uh, focus and commitment to the work and um, who are highly ethical and uh, who are knowledgeable. And so I'll find those people and, and, and create a team. And it will be a diverse uh, team of folks uh, who will be on just, they're ju they'll be just on fire for the work because I, we should be joyful about our work every day that we come. It's, you'll be tired at times, but I mean, it, it's, you should be. You should want to do this work. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Neill, Vice Chair Alva Davila. Thank you, and I apologize. I'm in a fog of drugs over here, um, so cold I'm medicine. sorry that at this last cold moment medicine. I'm cold. Thank you. Sorry, cold medicine. Do you see what I'm saying? Certainly over the counter. Do you see what I'm saying? It is over the counter. Just to prove that, there's my um, dayquil. Um, and I just want to say that um, Dr. Johnson told me that my daughter would be the president of the United States because her Aww. name is Marley Martinez. She said, who would have vote for a great name like that? So anyway, <laughs> good memories of uh, Dr. Johnson. Um, my question is, um, if you could just talk a little bit. I, I know that um, Dr. Rivera asked you a little bit about the Look Act, but if you could just talk about your experience working with English language learners and just based on what you know about our district, and I know you know, you'd have to come in and kind of take a deeper dive. Mm -hmm. But just based on what you have read, um, the reports that you've read, um, and what you know, can you just talk a little bit about what you what you think that we're doing well and where are maybe some areas based on, you know, you've had the commissioner point of view, which is more of a policy yep. um, perspective. I'm just curious about um, kind of things that that um, have been tried or best practices, things that maybe you think um, we would be able to do here that you would be looking at, and again, what are our strengths? Right, so thank you for that. And I think that the strengths are that you're attempting to do more inclusionary model and bilingual education. I think that those are uh, positive and promising practices. Um, and I, I am not an expert in EL, so I don't wanna pretend to be, but I would 
put myself around people who are and listen, listen to their counsel and their advice. Um, I have a strong uh, English language learner expert at the department and advocate. Uh, my assistant commissioner and my deputy commissioner when, for, when I first uh, started were uh, Hispanic and um, they took on a lot of that work and I, I had full faith and confidence in them. So I would surround myself around experts of people and begin to be advised by them and then talk to them and then talk to parents and talk to students about the strategies that would work best. My, my um, general philosophy is around valuing the assets of students who have EL, uh, valuing emerging multilingual learners, looking at opportunities for students, you know, our life students who don't have formal or, in, or interrupted education and trying to figure out strategies for them. Um, and then looking at bilingual um, interpreters and supports within the classroom, which is good, and then also training the general education teachers on those practices. I've also, you know, at the, as a practitioner level, when I was leading high schools, had experts who were working in, and we used uh, PSYOP and sheltered instruction protocols. And uh, I, I support some of that where it's needed uh, for some intense study for students but I also want to be able to have um, students in the classroom as much as possible uh, working with the supports in, in the actual classroom. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair. Well, we're almost out of time, and okay. so um, I'm deeply grateful for my colleagues for all of the uh, insightful questions, and I'm glad we've had a, a chance today to uh, get through a number of these questions and cover a lot of the ground that we've been able to cover with some of the other candidates to date. Um, we only have a few minutes remaining, so I certainly want to give you an opportunity to uh, uh, give us a closing statement, and then we'll, um, we'll uh, move on to let the public know where, uh, where we go next in this process. You've only got, you know, about four hours left in front of a microphone today. That's okay. Well, I appreciate all of you taking the time, and I appreciate the effort of the search committee um, as well for this incredible uh, opportunity to be among three wonderful, um, two other uh, wonderful options and candidates that you have and uh, bring a great talent. And so I know that you have a very difficult decision in front of you. Um, I am a lifetime educator and have spent my life advocating for children um, and creating more equitable opportunities and working to build up communities. I have um, specific uh, expertise in the area of budgeting and also policy and politics, obviously. Um, so, um, and broad scale strategic planning and uh, visionary, but also being able to actually execute and get results. So those are the things that I would bring to Boston um, and also just my own uh, ability to uh, build a strong team um, and, and work with that team to be able to work across sectors to get good results for the, for the whole community. And that's what I'd like to do. And so I thank you for this time, um, for you to get to know me better. I didn't share much about my own personal background, um, but I, I think you know it. So um, thanks again, and I look forward to um, possibly working with you in the future. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Yes. Caselius. We've uh, really enjoyed uh, the couple hours we've been able to spend thank with you. you here today. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, you do have a few uh, more uh, events on your itinerary this afternoon. Um, this will conclude our interview today in just a moment, but you'll be moving out to the Mildred Avenue K-8 school uh, for a 4.30 p.m. start with uh, students and teachers. And uh, then we will move back to this um, chamber at 6.30 p.m. Great. for another 90 minutes with uh, parents and school leaders. I want to remind folks in the audience uh, watching on TV as well that um, you can view the entire bu um, public uh, interview schedule as well as the bios and um, uh, resumes of each of our candidates at bostonpublicschools.org slash superintendent search. You can uh, email your feedback to superintendent search at bostonpublicschools.org. And you can also, uh, this is a new feature this year, uh, access a survey that's online at that superintendent search website uh, where members of the public can give us direct feedback, uh, direct feedback to the committee on each of the candidates that have come before us. That survey will uh, remain open until midnight on Sunday, April 28th. And uh, the results of that survey will then be distributed to members for review prior to our tentative vote, which is scheduled for next Wednesday, May 1st. If I hear nothing further, uh, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn this public interview. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. Is there a second? It sounds like unanimous consent. Thank you again, Dr. Caselius, and, uh, and good it. luck. Hope you feel better. Thank you.